Stephen Curry will be warming up soon right there at Oracle, where the Warriors are going to host the Bulls at 1030 Eastern on League Pass. And in the latest edition of Shooter's Paradise, Dennis 3D Scott talked with Steph about his pregame routine. What's up, basketball fans? It's your boy 3D. Went back for another edition of Shooter's Paradise. But this time, we're going to take you a little deep on preparation before the game. Now, obviously, you know who this guy is, MVP, Mr. Steph Curry. Yes, so, sir. Steph, people don't understand that you just don't wake up and just start jacking up shots. There is a method to your madness. So what is the first thing you try to do to find your rhythm? First thing I do um, is start in the paint, and I do a bunch of just crazy flip shots. It helps me just get a feel for the ball, uh, get my, my body warmed up, and you know, your hand-out coordination in terms of like, your finesse game and that touch, mm -hmm. which is key for me to be able to shoot the way that I do. Uh, I try to start in close, see the ball go in, try different angles, and then work my way out from there. For us real shooters, explain how you have to start in close and work your way out. You get to see the ball go in and build your confidence up early. Uh, and that's also just a, a touch thing. Um, starting in close, you can really feel the ball in your hands. You get your, your, your rhythm going. Uh, and then you work your way out from there. I, I treat five spots around the court um, and try to just get every possible shot that I would probably take in a game. A lot of them are more just stationary, catch and shoot, kind of your normal basic fundamentals, working on your mechanics. Uh, but then you got to test your creativity a little bit. And uh, obviously, like it, simulating a game where every possession, you don't know what the move is going to be. But you got to be able to react to the defender, take what they're giving you, make a play. So just feeling that ball transfer from hand to hand, uh, simulating you know, the defender trying to swipe at it and stuff, and then getting balanced and knocking down a shot. So it's a balance between the creative part of my game and the fundamentals uh, and, and good mechanics that every great shooter kind of taps into. How much fun is it for you, though, that when you have that freedom, when you can give the ball to KD or Iggy or Draymond, and you just can just run all over the floor? Back from when I was even playing in high school, I had to, I was playing for traditional point guards, had the ball in my hands a lot. When I got to college, I was playing off the ball a lot, right. so I got to work on both parts of, of it. So I, I feel like, you know, being able to shoot off the dribble or catch and shoot or be able to give it up and sprint miles around the court, you know, mm -hmm. make my defender chase me, but still be in balance and knock down shots is a big part of my game. And so in the fourth quarter, are you taking what the defense gives you or are you, are you taking what the team needs to win the ball game? That's where you're the full skill set that you got in the arsenal comes out because uh, you got to get it all sorts of ways, whether it's driving to the basket and finishing, uh, you know, mid range, you know, off the dribble, or if you got to take a dagger three, right. uh, you got to be ready for all those. There are there aren't many weaknesses. And that's the that's the <laughs> that's the part where all that work that you put in pays off. How did the tunnel shot come about? And we as shoes want to understand if you make that shot, does it make you think I'm going to have a good game or does it not affect you at all? <laughs> I feel better walking into the locker room after a make. Uh, but I've had some of my best games when I've missed the shot too. Ah. So it started uh, probably my, I think my second year in the league where I had a bet with one of our front office guys. And he was looking at the tunnel, and I bet you can't make it from there. Uh, at the time, I had seen Monte Ellis make it a couple of times. So like, I can, I can make it and try it. And we started to just keep tally every game, how many times I made versus miss. And at the end of the year, we, we tally it up and see who won. Uh, and it just evolved from there with uh, the usher uh, who throws me the ball. You make the pass Curtis, every time? Curtis, Curtis yeah. passed me the ball every time, so we got a nice little chemistry. The billion dollar question. With the new arena, how will the tunnel shot affect your preparation for a game? I have no idea. It's going to be it's, it's <laughs> a tough question because for 10 years I've been uh, accustomed to my routine, shooting the tunnel shot right before I go back to the locker room. So uh, I'll get a lay of the land when we get to the new Chase Center and, and really understand uh, how I can dial up my warm-up routine and have some fun with it, but to be determined. Awesome stuff. Uh, shout out to Steph Curry and the great uh, Dennis 3D Scott. Uh, you guys ever tried that that tunnel shot out at Oracle when you've been out there? How long is that shot? Like, how yeah, it, is that like a half court shot? Yeah, the like angle is a little off, but it's it's deep. It's it's difficult. Is it like is it like past a half court shot? Do you think it's that far? Yeah, I think it's a little bit past a half court shot. Interesting, and it's like a side pocket angle. Yeah. All right, compare his pregame routine to your guys' pregame routine. George, yours, big fella. My pregame routine was simple. Just dunks. No, nah, just a little. I, I, I didn't really George Mikan. Yeah, a little bit of the George Mikan drill. 
a little bit of quick little jump hooks inside, going around uh, basically the charge circle, which was my three-point line, mm -hmm. <laughs> and working on touch shots because that's where I was going to get a lot of my shots and then working on some free throws. I'd take a couple 15-footers, but that wasn't really what I worked on. I just wanted to make sure I got a lot of jump hooks in because a lot of my points were in the paint on rolls and catching the ball, going up quickly, and getting shots in the paint. Did you want defenders or by yourself? I'm saying no, I just wanted to, I didn't want a lot of defenders. I wanted just to basically go up, get my shots, and let, let that be that. Mine was kind of, we called it George Gervin, just the flick shots. We was always trying to hit off angles just to get loose. And then I didn't shoot a lot of threes. I wanted to keep my legs. And for me, I always had to play one-on-one -on -one in the post just to get that lather up and that fear. I wanted somebody to hit me, hit me, so I could get going. And this, so I could just feel that contact. Didn't want to go right in the game, started feeling contact, because I was a physical two guard on the block. I, 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 that's why I wanted to know where you were a guy that wanted physicality before the game. Yeah. I just wanted to get, I, 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 because I wasn't a guy that, you were going to get your number called one-on-one -on -one a lot. Mm -hmm. I was not. I was going to get mine off weak side duckings, opportunistic scoring, rolling to the basket. So I had to be able to just catch and go up really, really Quick. quickly, working on trying to get it off of both shoulders. But you, at the other hand, you, I'm sure people still hanging on you, though. Yeah, they were hanging on you, but there's a difference when they're like, hey, work on catching the ball on the block and creating your own shot. And so that wasn't really my thing. Uh, let me ask you this. Uh, Steph said there with Dennis Scott, um, that in his pregame routine, he's trying to find a balance between creativity and fundamentals. And, and that was like a, a, a takeaway for me. I mean, that, that, that sounds like a very difficult thing to do. Well, I, I'm glad he said that. One, for all these young guys out here, you, you got to have a base and a foundation of fundamentals before you start going anywhere else. You see guys come out, young guys, shooting fadeaways. If you can't shoot a straight up and down jump shot, you can't just work on fadeaways. Also, ball handling. If you can't dribble with your left and you're trying all these different things, he works on his fundamentals and he just adds some creativity to it. But the base of your game, you've got to be fundamentally sound to be a great player. Yeah, you can't get to third base without touching first and second first. <laughs> and to what, you, to what you were saying, I remember uh, Patrick Hume was one of my assistant coaches, and we had a young player, and he was like, Pat, why do you have me keep doing the same thing every day? He said, because you haven't mastered it yet. Why, I, why are we going to move on to something else? If you haven't mastered the basics of the regular 15-footer and the jump hook, why do I, why would, he said, why would I possibly have you doing step backs? And so that's one of those things that I agree with, Steph. Get the base right, and then you expand your game. You see too many young players now with a lot of these fancy dancy trainers with doing step backs, throwing tennis balls off the wall and all types of crazy stuff with blindfolds on like bird box. No telling. What. <laughs> you got a lot of wild stuff going on back there, but they haven't mastered the actual basics. Master the basics, figure out what your game is and then expound on it. Know your why, know your subject. And a lot of times everybody's trying to get to the prize first. I mean, you see kids now that start off shooting 25 footer. You're not Steph. You're not Clay. You're not KD. You're not James Harden. Work in the paint, be able to hit some mid-range shots first. Should we try to do a segment here blindfolded and just challenge ourselves? Nah, no, no, no bird box challenge here. We, <laughs> might, we might take a cameraman out or a camerawoman. Well, mm -hmm. I, I know I couldn't read prompter uh, uh, blindfolded. So that, 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 you that don't need work. prompter anyway. Yeah, you're good, you, uh, you you good man. You don't you're need that. Good. You go off the top of the dome, oh. off, off, off the cuff. You're too kind. You're too kind. Well, earlier this week, Steve Kerr did tell reporters that DeMarcus Cousins is expected to make his season debut around January 18th, maybe a little before, maybe a little bit afterwards. And yesterday, here's what Boogie had to say. Is there going to be a flood of emotions for you, though? How much you've been waiting for this and how much, I guess, maybe perspective it's put into your game and the love of basketball? It'll be a lot of emotions, honestly. And um, I don't think anybody could ever really understand this, and I don't really expect them to unless they've, you know, they've experienced themselves. Are you excited to play with Draymond as vocal as he is on the defensive end of floor? Are you excited to play with him? I'm excited to play with everybody. You know? I'm excited to be coached by the coaching staff. I'm excited play in front of the fans. I'm, I'm just excited to play basketball again. And we're all excited to see DeMarcus Cousins play for sure. Now, you know, when, when he was signed by Golden State, and you knew about the ruptured Achilles and the surgery and all that. It was sort of like, all right, all-star break, maybe February, maybe March. We're here in January talking about DeMarcus Cousins coming back. Uh, how much of a win is that for Golden State to get him back in January rather than February or March? It's an incredible win for this team. The rich get richer, and that's what's happening right here. When you look at DeMarcus Cousins coming back from this injury early, and he's a big-time presence, big-time personality. So I think it's important that they get him in early because – it's going to take a lot of time to work him in for him to feel comfortable and then there's going to be an adjustment period so you want that adjustment period to happen as early as possible in the season so going into the playoffs everybody knows their role and everything's on one page and on one accord 
You know, and I look at it, and, and I like this for them, and I like it for Boogie Cousin because you know he has to be ready to go. He still has to test his injury, but I think for him is he won't be just thrown in the fire, and he has to be the number one option, the number two option. He has to rebound. He's playing with the Golden State Warriors. He can take his time, and they can have him on a minute restriction and also get a chance to build him up for what we all know when they really need him when it comes down to stretching the playoffs. So they've been uh, four straight finals. That's a ton of extra games, maybe like a full season more in addition to 82-82, you know, over the last four. So how critical is DeMarcus Cousins to lighten the load a little bit of the, you know, the, the core four that's been there, uh, you know, most of this time? I think DeMarcus Cousins is key because when you look at this team, they're missing – that five spot this year. They're mm -hmm. missing the little bit of pop that they would get last year from JaVel McGee. They're missing uh, the young fella Jones. Those type of guys gave them a different dynamic that they don't really have right now, and they need to kind of find to get that back. DeMarcus Cousins isn't the ty same type of athlete to those guys, but he gives them a post presence, something that other teams have to game plan for. And the biggest thing I want to see is how will teams game plan them when they throw the ball into DeMarcus mm -hmm. Cousins and then they start doing all that weak side action. Because they get the backdoor cuts and the threes when they throw it into Draymond, and Draymond isn't the post player that DeMarcus Cousins is. So what happens if DeMarcus hits a jump hook or two in a row? Do you come with a double? Where does the double come from? This is something that other teams have never had to worry about with Golden State. They can now actually produce offense from the inside out with a true big. And you look at it, Brendan, I'm looking at it right now, is I got a chance to play with Tim Duncan and David Robinson. Clay and Steph and KD, those guys get a lot of threes off, of, like you said, Draymond in the post, split action, cut, moves, and they're all basically on the move. Now you're better throw it in, and <laughs> Clay can stand in the, in the corner, KD can stand at the top, and Steph can be on the wing or vice versa, and now they're going to be shooting standstill threes because if you go double, he's going to kick it out because he's still a great passer at that position. Now for them to get a chance to get standstill threes, their percentage might go up even a little bit more, and they are great shooters. Well, that's scary. Because that, a standstill three is totally different off the run. Clay, Clay and Steph's three-point percentage going up. Ooh, let, me say, let me say it, Brandon. I, no, I'm saying that's just scary to think about. I was so open in San Antonio, it scared me. I started, I led the league in three-point shooting at like 47%. So those guys, the way they shoot and they're getting wide open shots, if he's demanding double teams, it could be real scary. At 47.2, don't cheat yourself. It's somewhere around there. 47.2. I appreciate you. I, I at point two, boy, could have got I, us some more money. It, it could have. <laughs> hey, hey, you got a lot of money. You don't need no more, man. You're good. <laughs> All right, time for a break here on Game Time Live presented by State Farm. More lag.